שלום, רבי יצחק לוי, unveiling Torah truth on a weekly basis. תודה, thank you for joining us in this Torah study together. If these Torah portions uh, during the year have benefited you, if, uh, if you've learned something, we would really like to hear from you. You can uh, share it with me or with the station. So let us start the Torah portion called Miketz at the end. Very important portion toward this time of the year, based on Genesis 41, uh, verse uh, 1, till all the way to 44 and verse 17. I want to start with Genesis 38, verse 1, which is not portion of the reading, but I want to connect the dots. Right after the sale of Yosef, suddenly we find Yehuda, Judah, left his brothers and went down to Adulami. No reason given in the Torah why he would just leave them in such a, during the crisis of the sale of Yosef. So, Adulami, uh, if you're familiar with Hebrew prayers, Le'olam va'ed, Le'olam is forever, and Ed is eternity, forever and eternity in the prayers. And so here we see that this is what we found in Ad or Ed. Ed is also a witness. Leolam for forever and witness. Very important word. Here we see that this word in this case means justice of the people or whose witness or their witness. Ad Ulami. And then we find it changing its name by re removing the Yod in the end. It is known as one of the royal cities of the Canaanites. It is mentioned in Joshua chapter 12 verse 15. And there it's not Adulami but Adulam. Even stronger reference to forever and eternity. Again in chapter 15 of Joshua in verse 35, the word again is Ad Ulam, Ad Ulam. Ad Ulam stood on the old Roman road in the valley of Elah, which was the scene of David's victory over Goliath, or Goliath in English, based on 1 Samuel 17 and verse 2. It was one of the towns which Rehoboam fortified against Egypt, based on 2 Chronicles 11, verse 7. Rehoboam, son of Solomon Shlomo, was king in Yehuda, in Judah, Judea. Adulam was called in Hebrew, in Israel, back in the day, the glory of Israel, based on Micah 1 and verse 15. Adulam, again, forever. Huge word for all Torah students and Torah believers because ultimately we are studying and we're working out our salvation daily with what? With fear and trembling, or we should. So I want to touch on a point based on the power of two. We know that God uses all kinds of numbers. Adonai Echad, based on the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elohim, Adonai Echad. Then we have the two, which is the two tablets of stone, the commandments. Three is the patriarchs, four is the matriarchs, five we know is the Chumash, six is the days of the week, seven is week plus Shabbat, a cycle of seven, eight is circumcision, nine is pregnancy, and the ten commandments. But I want to talk about the number two, which is strongly referred to in this portion. I'm going to start with the garden. There was two trees, two trees. And then we find that those two, two trees represent two forces, the evil and brings death, and the good, which brings life eternal. Then we go to the two brothers, Cain and Abel. And the two brothers of Isaac, Isaac, and Ishmael. 
Then we have the two brothers of Yaakov, Jacob and Esav, Esau. The two brothers, Zerach and Peretz. And then Israel divided into two kingdoms, Judah and Israel. We know about the two temples. And then we know that both temples were destroyed. Again, two, the number of two. The two destructions. And then those destructions are done by the two superpowers of the world. The first one being Babel, Bab Babylon, the first superpower. The second superpower is Rome. And then we find that Yosef, Joseph, worked for his uncle 20 years. Remember, if we remove the zeros, uh, which zeros do not count in the Torah, if you remove the zeros, again, we have the 20 becomes 2. And then Yeshua, while Yaakov, Jacob, served his uncle Lavan, which means white. The Revelation talks about the white throne. So we find that Yeshua, again, for the number 2, 2,000 years, has been serving his God in the white, which represents righteousness. Jacob when he comes out away from Laban, he settles in Sukkot. Sukkot. And then we find that when Israel came out of Mitzrayim from Egypt, the first stop was Sukkot. But then Yeshua served his God in the white throne for two years or 2,000 years. And when he comes back, he's bringing a kingdom of Sukkot based on Zechariah 14 and verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts. What is host? In Hebrew is Tzvaot, the God of the armed forces. And to keep the feast of tabernacles, one can keep the Feast of Tabernacles only if there are existing tabernacles in place. So when the people come, the nations come once a year to worship God in Jerusalem, in the Feast of Tabernacles, they're not going to be bringing their tabernacles with them, and they're not going to be building them. So that means that this is going to be a kingdom of tabernacles, and they're going to come to Jerusalem to serve God once a year in the Feast of Sukkot. Again, we're going to continue with the number two. Like Rebecca, Tamar gives birth to two twins, two boys. And like Rebecca, Tamar's sons struggle in the womb to be first. Who wants to be first? Out. Like Rebecca, Tamar wears a veil. And then we look in Genesis 38, verse 15, and Genesis 24 and 65. We find Rebecca wearing a veil when she found out who Isaac Isaac was. The hand of the one emerges from the womb and a scarlet thread is placed on his wrist. But his twin brother struggles and succeeds to be born first. He is named Peretz, Peretz, one who breaks through. Speaking of Yeshua, Yeshua was the first to break through the death the curse that was put upon man. And the one with the scarlet thread is named Zerach. Zerach, of course, speaking of Israel. His name comes from a verb meaning to rise or to shine. The meaning is generally thought to derive from the scarlet cord wrapped around his wrist. The scarlet cord wrapped around his wrist was red and is bright, reminiscent of the sunrise or the sunshine. When Moshe and Moses came down from Mount Sinai, his face was shining like the sun. After receiving the Torah on behalf of all the nation of Israel, Israel then becomes a spiritual shine of the world. God actually wants to make Israel a nation of kings and priests. The one who is supposed to come first has a scarlet thread put 
on his wrist. Similar to Esau and Jacob. But Esau, in this case, did not have a ribbon, but he was had red hair. But this time, the younger twin, Peretz, okay, manages to achieve what Jacob could not achieve. Emerging first from the womb, this points that Yeshua was the first of those who resurrected. Yeshua is Peretz. He is the younger of the two. He is the one who breaks through death, becomes victorious, while his brother Zerach is Israel. Israel will break through next. When? At the end. When her brother, when Israel's brother comes back with the kingdom of God, okay, with the new city of Jerusalem, Israel will look upon him and will be saved, and they will shine like the sun. From the book of Ruth, chapter 4, verse 18 till 22, Peretz becomes the ancestor of King David, King David. Zerah, beginning of light, is Israel, the one with the scarlet thread. So, Genesis 38, verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that, behold, twins, too, were in her womb. I'm going to read till the verse 30. Verse 28, And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound upon his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. But you see, hand is just not enough. You've got to come out of the womb completely before you receive the blessing of the birthright. Verse 29, It came to pass... As he drew back his hand, that behold, his brother came out, and he said, How hast thou broken forth this breach be upon thee? Therefore his name was called Peretz. And afterward, verse 30, came out his brother that had a scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zerach, or Zerach, to shine. It's unfortunately, it's unfortunate that God desired for his son to come out of Egypt and to become right away all 12 tribes to be a nation of kings and priests. But instead, they failed and failed big by building and worshiping a golden calf instead of God. And therefore, instead of the 12 tribes to become a nation of priests and kings, God has divided them into two camps. One is the Levites for the priestly, and one is the tribe of Yehuda for the kingly. Now, Yehuda, Judah, accepts life and what it brings. He even accepts the death of his two sons without any complaints. It's almost as if he predicted it. He already knew the outcome of his life and what was waiting for him. We still don't know really why he left the brothers in the midst of the crisis. But we're going to find out, maybe, with time. Yosef, Joseph had two dreams, again back to two, which resulted him to be, being in Egypt. His dreams were in the father's house, in Yaakov's house, and now these dreams came to fruition. He ends up in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. He meets two Egyptians in the prison, the servants of Paro. They each also have two dreams that need interpreting. After two years, Paro has two dreams that Joseph interprets successfully. If you sum it up, you will see there's a total of 10. The number 10 is the number of righteousness. Again, the two dreams become reality. This encourages Joseph that his dreams will become also, will be fulfilled in his lifetime. The two dreams he had represents the two models of his rulership. 
Number one, he's the viceroy in his father's home, in, his, in, his, in Jacob's father's home, with a coat of stripes representing the, not only his uh, placement as his father has upgraded him to be only second to his father through the coat that his father made for him, but also this coat represents the suffering he must endure before being promoted. So yes, that coat that his father made for him caused him almost his death, but ended up him becoming the viceroy, not of a little shepherd's house, but of all of Egypt, superpower. Number two, in Egypt, he is thrown in prison before being promoted as the viceroy of Egypt, the prince of Egypt. Yeshua was the viceroy in heaven. We want to look at the parallels here. How important. Yeshua was the viceroy in heaven, his father's kingdom. He too was given a coat of stripes representing the suffering he must endure before being promoted as the viceroy on earth. When? At his return, he will become the king of all kings and every knee, believers or non-believers, will bow and every tongue, believers or not believers, will confess. The original famine comes after two years of drought. We know that in Israel there's not much rainfall and it was even worse in the Bible days. Jacob sends his ten sons, all but one, ben Yamin, Benjamin. He sends them to Egypt where food can be purchased. The ten represents the ten tribes of Israel that was sent out into the world as a punishment by God. God used Nebuchadnezzar on the first expulsion, and then the second expulsion was the total house of Israel. But under the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the first expulsion was the ten tribes, known as the tribes of Israel, while the other two tribes were Benjamin and Yehuda, Judah. It has been 20 years. Again, we look at those numbers as divide 20, that's two multiples of 10, 2 times 10 is 20. Since Yosef's disappearance, but Yosef is always on Jacob's mind. He never truly accepted the story of the sons. There was always a question mark. How did it happen? Who did it? How come there was no witnesses to that? And now we see it has been 2,000 years that Yeshua is gone. And there is a famine in the land, not maybe for bread and water, but famine in the land for righteousness, for truth. But Yeshua has to return to put an end to the famine and to slavery known as sin. Yeshua is always on his father's mind. Let's not forget when we pray, we pray not to Yeshua, but we pray to his father, to God. In the name, because Yeshua is our representative, right? He's our attorney, our advocate. Just like in regular court, you cannot talk to the judge directly unless you're asked by the judge a specific question. But normally, the judge will talk to you through your lawyer, and you will talk to the judge through your lawyer. And here Yeshua is our advocate, and we talk to God through him. We're told Yaakov did not send Benjamin with his brothers to Egypt. Genesis 42 and verse 4. He will not risk Rachel's remaining child. Benjamin or Benjamin is the only evidence, the only thing he had as a reminder of his beloved wife. No doubt he must have resembled a lot like his mama. And he was not going to risk his life by sending him to Egypt. Again, we see a blessing in chapter 49. All ten brothers are brought to Joseph. And Yosef recognizes 
all ten brothers, all ten tribes of Israel are going to be brought before Yeshua when he returns. So again, what does 10 represent? Remember the number 10 is also known in, in Aramaic as Minyan. Minyan is the number 10. When you have 10 men together praying, they become united as one. And they represent, their prayer represents and covers all the nation of Israel. Not 8, not 9, not 11, but 10. Minyan. Here we see that the 10 brothers stand before Yosef. Just like we see the 10 tribes will one day stand before Yeshua. Why are they brought to him? Are all who come to purchase food in Mitzrayim taken to the viceroy to present them before him? Absolutely not. But all this is ordained by God. It is in the blueprint, in the plans of God of how these things are supposed to turn out. God is in charge. He is the great creator and master planner. So his brothers do not recognize him since he is dressed in his capacity as the viceroy. His name was changed. His clothing are Egyptian. He speaks the native Egyptian language. He understands them, but they do not understand him. So... It is ironic how Isaac did not recognize Jacob disguised as Esau or Esau, right? He says, your voice sounds like Yaakov, but your hair, your hand, it feels like your brother Esau. B, Jacob, on his wedding night, did not recognize Leah disguised as Rachel, as Rachel. We see all this, all this deception going back and forth, and everything has to give an account. There's got to be a balance. No one can just get away with lies and deception. There is a reckoning, the day of reckoning, the time of reckoning. We need to bear this in mind. See, now Jacob's children do not recognize their brother Yosef. Jacob was not Esau, and Leah was not Rachel. In, is Joseph the viceroy still Joseph? Or has the reality of being the viceroy altered him somehow? Was he still the son of Jacob? The brother of his brothers? Was Yeshua still the son of God? Is he still the brother of his brothers Israel? Of course he is. Twenty years have passed. The handsome young man has not only aged, but is now dressed royally as an Egyptian ruler. Yosef recognizes his brothers. This is a perfect shadow of Yeshua when he came the first time. He recognized his people, his brothers, but his nation did not recognize him. At his return, he will reveal himself to them and they will cry as one cries for his only begotten. Only begotten what? Only begotten son. Notice what Zechariah 12, 10 tells us. And I will pour out on the house of David, David, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look upon me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for his firstborn son. So we see that there is the day of reckoning. The viceroy sets a test for his brothers. They must prove their honesty by bringing their youngest brother to him. Reuben, the oldest, and the firstborn understands and says, it is because we have sinned against Yosef, based on 42, Genesis 42, verse 22. Yosef sends them home, Im imprisoning only Simon, Shimon. Why, of all the brothers, does he pick on Shimon? Because he was the leader of the Shechem massacre. Remember Shechem or Shechem? 
Shimon Simon released the pen on Ben Yamin. He will not be released until Ben Yamin shows up. Shimon, the cruelest of the brothers, traded for Ben Yamin, the future king of the world. So Ben Yamin, son of my right hand, is ultimately what Yeshua is. And Shimon, the cruelest of them, of the brothers, is going to be traded in for Benjamin, or metaphorically speaking, going to be traded in for Yeshua. What does Benjamin's return have to do with the brothers being accused of spies? The word in Hebrew used by Yosef is to see the nakedness, arvat, the nakedness of the land. Chapter 42, verse 9. Did Yosef remember that they took off his stripped coat and made him naked and threw him in the pit? Yosef remembers his dream that his 11 brothers, sheaves, will bow down to him. His 10 brothers have bowed to him when they came to purchase wheat. The sheaves in the dream were 11, and therefore he awaits Benjamin, the 11th brother. Ten brothers is the tithe. Ten represent the total sum of the nation. Why was Shimon chosen to be arrested? Shimon was also the leader of his brothers who wanted to kill Yosef. And Genesis 4 and verse 30 tells us Shimon and Levi are ber berated by Yaakov for the Shechem massacre. As time just flees so fast, just when we're getting into the beautiful part of the portion. Until next time, shalom, shalom.